Okay. So. All right, are you all able to hear me um, and see everything? Good? Okay, so just um, if for any reason you can't hear anything or can't see me, please unmute yourself and interrupt. Um, also, if you have a question at any point, please also un un unmute yourself and interrupt. Are you all, just because I've never been on the other end of this with Zoom, can you also still see me even though I'm sharing my screen? Okay. Yes. We can okay. see in the little postage area there. Right, good, good. I just want to make sure. All right, so, so this is I'm gonna Opera, I call this Opera 101, but it's really just kind of a survey of all the different styles of opera. And I'm just going to kind of go through the history and some of the stylistic characteristics of the different opera I just, styles. I, just, I want to tell you just one thing yes? before you start. I, I, uh, if the phone rings, I'm going to have to hang up. My daughter's in the hospital with COVID-19, oh, and I'm waiting I'm to hear from the doctor. So um, if I leave, that's why. And now I'm going to mute myself. OK. Cindy, All right. Those... No, I, I understand. That's completely fine. Let me just take Cindy, one here. last uh, look for that other person just to make sure that they, I don't miss out on them, because I don't think it'll notify me if uh... oh. Nope, she still says joining. All right, well, we will go back to this. Darren, do you think she needs to join Zoom? Do you think she's think, just trying to use the link and doesn't doesn't have that? I think probably I did in? email her. I did email her like a, a a personalized invitation to Zoom, and it didn't go through. I mean, it, it it went to her email address, but probably she just has gotten to the stage where you have to download Zoom and hasn't gotten through. So it, it, it it's okay. It's it happens with. Uh, all of this. I will uh, send her an email. Okay, and yes, and we are also uh, recording this too, so we'll be able to do it that way, which is nice. Um, I just chatted with, I just chatted her also. Oh, okay. All right. All right. Well, um, so we start with the history of opera in Florence. The, um, this group in, I, I wrote the date down here, yes, 1573. Um, a group of intellectuals came t together with the idea of, li since during the Renaissance there was a great interest in ancient history, ancient Greece, ancient Rome, this group called the Florentine Camerata came t together with the idea of trying to recreate um, uh, Greek th uh, th theater. So the idea that they came up with was that the, the Greek plays must have been sung throughout. So they must have sung throughout the plays. Um, and they didn't really know how to dramatically make it work to have singing throughout a play. Because it was considered awkward to have a trans, like to, to transition from, from speaking to, to singing. And we, we can still see that today. It does come across as awkward, like if you go to a Broadway show and, you know, they have the monologue before they start singing and the, the band kicks up. It's kind of an awkward transition into singing. Um, so what they came up with is maybe they can just sing throughout. And this was, let me see. Yes, there we go. So they, from this idea, they devo developed the concept of stil recitativo, which is, um, which is basically singing throughout in a conversational style. And the, the, this, the essential concept of recitative or recitativo has persisted throughout all of opera history. And that's basically just how to advance the plot while singing. So you basically, you just have chords. On, and then under those chords you have, I think I need to go outside and check the plants because the plants look like they're cold. Or something like that. So basically just chords with spoken style singing over it. Now in the Renaissance period, what we're talking about now, it was considered, um, th this, this style was considered oddly more expressive than the, than the, the aria or the song or the or anything else in it. So a lot of the very heavily dramatic moments were put on the 
uh, to, to tease. And I think we'll we'll see one of those. I tried to go through and pick enough clips to show um, to show off some of these concepts, but there's just so much that I'd like to show. It's hard to kind of pare it down. But okay, um, awkward speaking singing transition. All right, so the first opera was by a member of this group, um, Acapo Perry, and it was composed full length singing in 1597. It was Orfeo, actually, which we're going to talk about a different Orfeo in a second, but um, we don't have that opera now. The second opera was also by the same composer. Actually, I'm sorry, no, the, the first opera was uh, uh, Daphne. Daphne was his first opera, also a Greek myth. And then the second opera, 1600, was also by Jacopo Perry, called uh, Eurydice, based on the Orpheus and Eurydice myth. Um, so now we're going to go to the first opera that's sort of, sort of frequently performed. That's Orfeo by Monteverdi. I'm going to move myself over here so you can hopefully see there. See, see the picture of Claudio Monteverdi. Um, all right. So, uh, written in 1607, it was essentially basically a hodgepodge and fusion of different styles of Renaissance music, all connected by this recitative style. Um, so you'd have like a country dance. Um, you have you have like a a country song. You have Adrigals, which is, we all kind of know the idea of a madrigal, even if you don't know you do. Like, you know, deck the halls with boughs of holly, fa la 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 la, is essentially an English madrigal. Um, it, it uses text painting, and that's one of the characteristics of a madrigal. Um, but that, that's, we're not going to get into that right now. So, madrigal songs and recit. And I have a little clip of it that I want to show you. Because I figured that would be a fun thing to do. Let's. Can you all hear it? So what's going on right here is the messenger is coming to interrupt the the uh, festivities of Orfeo's wedding to say that his wife has died. She's been bitten by a snake. And if you notice in opera later on, this would be like a dramatic aria about, oh, someone's died. But here in this early, early piece, it is, um, it is in, in the recitative style. So it's just basic chord accompaniments um, with her lines sung on top of it in a kind of spoken declamation. And just pay, pay attention to where those really dissonant um, intervals lie. So like they'll, they'll do tritones and stuff, which kind of has a clash in the ear um, over really important or harsh text and stuff like that. So just pay attention to how it sounds in relation to that. All right, well, let's hear a little bit of this.
All right, I wanted to interrupt this for one second. Um, and I was, I, I was trying to share that so you could actually see it. Are you able to? Or are we not? Okay, so let me, let me fix that. And uh, we'll watch just a little bit more because it does actually have translations. And I do want, which is helpful. Um, let me, apparently you can't switch between um, different tabs when you're sharing on Zoom. I did not realize that. Okay, now are you able to to see? Yes. Okay, great. All right, so I, I'm going to stop there because I think I, my internet just cut out for a second anyway. But um, let's go back to our slides. So one thing that, that you, you should have noticed there is that n normally in that type of a scenario with an opera where a major character has just died, that you'd expect like an aria or something like that. But instead you get this really subdued recitative style, which was very characteristic of that, of early opera. Like I was saying, the, um, the recitative was used to, because it was thought to display more emotions than um, an aria. Um, let's go on, to, let's move on just for time's sake to our next thing. If, okay, so yes, as I said, with Greek, with um, they were trying to recreate Greek theater, and are they right? Well, the answer is no, they were not right, um, and I will show you why. So the modern efforts to kind of reconstruct music, they've actually found like 40 or so pieces of ancient Greek music, which is quite cool. Um, and they, they, this one that I've got right here is, I believe, a Euripides play. So this is from one of his plays. It's been reconstructed and performed. I will play you some of this. Um, are you, you, you shouldn't, you're probably not able to see my screen right now with this on here, but it's, it's fine. It's just an image on YouTube at the moment. But when there is an opera clip, I will bring it back. As long as you, if you can't hear it, please let me know. I'm going to play it right now. Okay, so I'm going to pause it right there because that's not technically opera. Um, but as you can tell from that, that's not not even close to what they were trying to develop for the recitative style. It is still very chant-like, but the the modes they use are completely different. Like for a while, they thought that you know the Ionian Dorian, the, all those those church modes as they called them in the medieval 
times, those are actually not even close to the ancient Greek modes um, that, that we have found right now. All right, let's move on. So now we're moving to a Baroque opera. What I've chosen to play us here is Handel. Um, basically, the concept with Baroque opera is it was a very florid style with lots of ornamentation. So the dramatic, the drama of the story was advanced through um, through the recitative, but then the <laughs> moment was highlighted by an aria. Um, and these arias were very, very decorated to try to show off the skills of the singer. Um, the favorite vehicle for that was the castrato, which is, of course, a castrated male singer. And the, the reason for this was because they were able to attain the range that they had as a child, but also have a much more powerful voice. That's why it was um, that, that practice continued for so long. Uh, and then there was also the concept of the de capo aria, which is ABA, um, in, in terms of the overall structure of the aria. So there's a first section, then there's a contrasting middle section, and then it ends with a repeat of the first section, which is ornamented. And when I say ornamented, they'll add decorations. Um, and basically, the first section will have text, then the second section, different text, and then it will return to the same text. So let's stop sharing this. <clears throat> hey, Dear Darren, I just have a quick question. Oh, yeah, sure. What does de capo mean? What is that? Oh, it's an Italian word that um, it means to the head, or like, so it, so it basically means back to the top. Okay. Just, oh, it's like uh, to the top aria. And it's called that because it would be two contrasting sections and then go back to the top of the piece. Thank you. Sure, sure. And yeah, and yeah if, you, if you have any questions, please feel free to interrupt. All right, so now I'm going to share this aria. So... Okay, so now we're going to skip to the middle section, just so I have enough time. Well, I skipped over the middle section. <laughs> Okay, I'm gonna stop right there. So, um, 
basically you you heard that the I, I know I did skip over a lot of the middle section, but there was a little bit of contrast in there before it went back to the uh, de capo section. Um, and the the second time through that, if you noticed, it was it was much more ornamented than the first time through, and it was basically a snapshot of an emotion. So that that was actually a translation. That's why I'm not too much in favor of translating opera because. It was still pretty hard to understand, even though that was in English. Um, but basically, it was just that character that was originally a, a, a castrato role. That's why it was being sung by a, a woman, which is frequently how that's handled nowadays. Um, but that character was just angry because they had been betrayed by a, of interest. And basically, that whole aria was just a snapshot of that emotional state, which is essentially what happens in the majority of the Handel operas. Um, all right, moving on to Mozart. With, now we have arrived at classical opera. Um, so it, it moved away from that focus on, the, on the, the florid technical aspects of singing and more towards like a fusion of technique and also drama as well. Um, I want to show you a clip from the... Marriage of Figaro, which uh, let's, let's open this. I appreciate how Zoom likes to um, let you like only share the one thing, but sometimes it's actually easier if you just share your screen, share your screen. So basically. I chose this because it's a it's a trio, so it's more than just a single person singing, which in Baroque opera was very uncommon. It it happened on occasion, but this this is a trio that actually is used to advance some of the plot, which is also m more in the classical direction as opposed to Baroque, when you'd only have that singing um, if it was a highlighting of a specific em emotion. So basically, the overall plot of the Marriage of Figaro. Let me share my screen with that so the overall plot of the opera is the count um, is in love with his maid Susanna um, but the count is already married which doesn't isn't, isn't a problem for the count but is a problem for everyone else in this um, and he is trying to woo Susanna so what's happening in this scene is he is convinced that um, his his servant is trying to woo his wife which is kind of a double standard, but that's kind of the whole point. Um, and he's convinced his his servant is locked in the closet in their room, um, and they, he has been told that it's Uzana, the maid, who's locked in the closet, and he is furiously trying to get Uzana out of the closet, even though it's actually Carabino who is the uh, his page. Um, it. it it's a little bit complicated, but hopefully we'll uh, do this one at some point in Inter Harbor, and then it'll be hopefully a little bit easier to understand. Uh, but I, let's listen to this.
Okay, so um, if you saw over in that corner, there was someone under the bed. That was the actual uh, Uzana the maid, who they were, th who she, who the countess is saying is in the closet. So in the, in the, in the next scene, it's kind of humorous because then she actually ends up in the closet, even though she wasn't there before. It's it's confusing, but it also ends up being quite funny. Um, let me share. Go back to sharing. Oh, this is going to start playing now. I don't want to play the next part of Figaro. Or Barbara. We already heard that. Uh, okay, so now moving on. We already saw this. All right, so, that, so our next thing is a Zingspiel which was also sort of a creation of the classical period. Um, you, you may notice in the corner the Winter Harbor Music Festival Magic Flute poster because the Magic Flute is a zingspiel. Um, basically, what it means, it's literally a sung play. So it's a play that has um, operatic style music in it. Um, that, that's why if you, if you did see the Magic Flute, you remember that there was dialogue in the Magic Flute. And in our, in our production, we translated that dialogue to English. Um, so the, and the majority of the plot is advanced through the dialogue and not through the singing. Although the Mozart's singspiels are kind of an exception because he does do, he breaks some of the rules. Um, there is very little or no Adjective. That's the the stuff that I was talking about before, with just the chord accompaniment and the singing over top of it. That doesn't really happen very frequently. Although in in the Magic Flute there is one section of adjective, and just to show you some of these things, I'm going to um, share a production with you, which I think some of you may recognize. Uh, skip ahead. Really taxing on the internet to do the Zoom call and show videos. <laughs> so, this is Hammond Hall. So, here, dialogue. So you, you see the, the, the introduction of the characters. This is something that in a normal opera would be done as a recitative, but in this case, it's done as dialogue. Um, there is a recit, if I can find that. It might be kind of interesting to show that as well, provided the internet cooperates. Pause right here. So basically, I think Mozart is using the adjective and sort of breaking the zingspiel 
style to highlight the dramatic quality of this action. This is basically where the chief priest is telling uh, 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 Tamino that he won't be allowed into the temple. Um, but this is all on, on YouTube. If you haven't seen it, I encourage you to watch it. This, everyone has a lot of time now, so um, stop screen share. Now let's go back to my slides. Okay, so now we're coming to uh, Rossini. We're moving out of the classical period um, into come on, uh, what's called as bel canto opera. Um, th th this that translates to uh, beautiful voice. So beautiful voice opera essentially is what this was. And as you can kind of guess from the name of that style, it did return to focus on the on technique and ornamentation and things like that. There's always been kind of throughout all of music history, there's kind of a back and forth between, oh, we should just focus on the sound and the drama, or we should focus on technique and ornamentation and showing off our skills. So that this is going back towards virtuosity, but in a different style, we'll see in a second. There's also the concept of the shena or scene. Um, so basically, it was a large, like 20 minute structure that was used where you'd have um, Recitative, then a character would enter and sing an aria, then you'd have more recit, and then you'd have like a trio or a quartet, and then you'd have recit, and then you'd go into a larger ensemble. It was just basically a way of creating a coherent opera scene over a long period of time um, that, that they used in this period. I, I have an example of one that if there's time at the end, which there probably won't be, I was going to show you, but... Um, we can we can see if we have if we have time. But the the clip of this that I wanted to show you is something that everyone would know: the aria Argo al Factorum, which is sung by the character of Figaro. Basically, he's just telling the audience and telling everyone how much everyone in, in the town asks him things. So that how how much they ask him to help them how much uh, they ask him to, to do favors for them and how he kind of gets pulled in every direction. So he's just basically the go-to guy of the town and this is what he's singing about here. Also, incidentally, this play, if you, if you the Mozart opera that I showed you before, the Marriage of Figaro and the uh, Figaro character in this play, The Barber of Seville, are actually this, the same characters. They, both of these operas were based on two plays by uh, the French play, play, playwright Beaumarchais that were written in the 1780s. So the plays preceded the operas, of course, but then the it's a little confusing because the Mozart and Marriage of Figaro chronologically occurred before The Barber of Seville in terms of when it was written, but it's actually based on the second play of the Beaumarchais trilogy. And this, this opera that we're going to hear part of, the Arbor Seville, is based on the, f the f first play of the Beaumarchais trilogy. So we get to see the character of the Count before he's married and trying to sleep with his uh, servants. And we, we get to see all these characters a few years prior. Um, but let's, let's click on this. All right. Come on. Pena e amor non si vergogna.
stop right there just so we have more time to hear other things um i wanted you to hear that kind of iconic part right there basically what he's saying is that everyone's always asking him to do something and he's he, there's there's that uno a la volta uno a la volta which means one at a time so he's like please just just talk to me one at a time um all right our next after Rossini. Now we're going on to Verdi. So this is sort of more high romantic opera. Um, focus, again, away from technical virtuosity and ornamentation. You saw a lot of jumping around in that uh, Barbara Seville clip that we just saw right there. A, a lot of things that are difficult to sing. And I'm not saying Verdi is not difficult to sing. It, pre it presents different, a, a, a different type of difficulty. But it's not as focused on florid ornamentation like the... Rossini bel canto style. Um, like the accompaniments in the orchestra are often less complicated in parody operas, especially in the earlier ones, just to kind of show the melodic line of, of the singer. So you kind of get something like... Which is kind of a reoccurring joke with me that that's the, the, the accompaniment to every aria of parody, which... Uh, it's it's not completely, but that the, the, there there are, there is a lot of that that goes on. We'll we'll hear um, a famous aria that I think that you will know, but you can hear that pattern um, happens quite frequently in the lower parts of the orchestra and while the singer is singing. <laughs> Oh, <laughs> 
He held that for a really long time at the end there. Uh, so, yeah, so, uh, just, just to kind of explain what was going on there, his the character that Pavarotti was playing is the Duke, and oh, let me get back to sharing. And his he's basically a womanizer, and but he's singing the, the text there is women are fickle like the breeze, but it's essentially him who is. Pickle always changing his interests, but um, that's the text of that. And let me, sorry, it's hard to talk and get back into these PowerPoint things. Okay, okay, we have covered Verdi. All right, now we come to Wagner. So with, the, with, with Wagner, we get the idea of the Gesamtkunstwerk, which is basically translates, it's a long German compound word that translates to total work of art essentially. And basically the idea was that he would create um, a piece that everything in it was art. So he, he had his, his, a hand in creating the set pieces. He wrote the text for the opera, which was not a, a common practice. Usually that was done by a librettist, but he wrote his own text. Um, he of course wrote the music. Um, and we'll talk about the specific style. He even constructed an opera house. That's what you see up in the left corner. That's the, the uh, Bayreuth Opera House. Um, he was the first one to have the idea of an orchestra pit. So if you see, there's a little diagram under his face right here. That's a diagram of the orchestra pit at the Bayreuth House. So if you see, basically, if you look where the conductor is, I'm not sure if you can see my mouse, but I'm circling around him. The, the conductor was completely covered by that overhang there, and the orchestra was essentially mostly covered too. Basically, no one in the audience would be able to see the orchestra at the Bayreuth house, and that was in, in order to make it so the audience wasn't distracted by anything. So the idea was that you should focus just on the action on the stage, which I know can be difficult when it's a five-hour opera, but that's Wagner. Um, he, he, if you look at the seats in the Bayreuth house, you see that they're all pacing towards the stage. That's actually, that was actually a new thing as well. Um, and for the earlier operas, like the operas like Mozart's Day, they would have had tables. It would have been a flat surface with tables and chairs where people could, could stand. It was a very informal setting. This idea of you have to sit in your seat and look at the at the action on stage, that's a very Wagnerian concept. Um, so let's keep going with Wagner. So that, then there was also the idea that he created of the uh, light motif, which is basically a theme for an idea or character. So now this concept has been pretty much adopted ad nauseum by composers of scores for Hollywood. So basically, like a, a good example of a light motif is just, you know, um, well, no, uh, I actually have them on there. I'll, I'll, I'll play you some, but if you think of Star Wars, if you think of any film like that, they have the idea of a light motif. Whenever Darth Vader comes on, there's always his theme or something like that. Um, he also has a bit of a controversial history because of, he wrote, wrote um, a book entitled On Jewishness in Music, which was later looked to by um, uh, Hitler and the Nazis as you know, a great display of their ideas. Um, and he, he was kind of, he became kind of the flagship composer, even though he was not alive at that point. 
So you kind of have to do a little bit of s separating the artwork from the artist with him. Um, but also his book that he wrote was basically just an attempt to say bad things about his former teacher, Ayerbeer, who was Jewish. Um, but he just used that as a way of attacking him. And actually, the idea of the leitmotif can be heard a little bit in Ayerbeer's operas, which we, we don't have time for now. So he kind of stole that idea and popularized it from his former teacher and then wrote a book about his former teacher and how awful he was. So he was overall not a great guy, but did some good things for, for music history. So let's look at some of these leitmotifs. Uh, we're not going to vote sec yet. Okay. All right, let's share this screen. Okay, so this is basically someone has gone through the entire Wagner uh, Ring cycle, which the, the ring cycle is four operas, each about four to five hours, and they have analyzed which theme plays in which scenes. People get very obsessive with Wagner, but that's not what I want to use this site for. I want to use this for the leitmotifs. Oh, where is it? Aha, here we go. Forgot how complicated this site was. Some, someone has a lot of time to look through their leitmotifs. All right, well, let's. Nature is not a good one. Vota. Okay, here we go. Otan Spear. Let's play this one. Alright, well then, uh, oh, okay, I can play it on this too. So basically, you hear that idea whenever Otan sings about his spear. Um, one of them that you'll also know. There's also one other leitmotif that everyone would know is the Valkyrie uh, theme. The dun 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 bum bum ba dum bum bum. That is the theme associated with the uh, warrior maidens or the Valkyrie. Now, basically, the story for all the, for the ring cycle was taken um, kind of liberally, not very accurately, from um, the the a Norse mythology. So it, it draws on like the gods like Odin and Loki and all those guys to create kind of a, a story that's inspired by Norse myths, but not directly, um, not directly taken from Norse myths. So let's look at part of the end of De Valkyrie.
I'm going to pause it there so I can kind of explain what's going on before I show some of the end. Um, basically, Otan is saying farewell to his daughter, who is of Valkyrie, who um, basically did what he wanted her to do, but she wasn't allowed to do it, even though he wanted her to, to do it. So because he's the king of the gods, he has to punish her. And he, he punishes her by making her human and leaving her in a sleep on a, a rock to be essentially claimed by wh whoever is brave enough to find her. Um, so we heard, we heard at the start, we heard a light motif. We heard this, this, the light motif for Siegfried, uh, who is this hero that is talked about, who is going to set everything right. So he was, t Otan, the character, was t talking about Siegfried. And when he was talking about this character who's going to arrive in the future, they play his theme, which is a lot like, like I said, a lot like what Hollywood does nowadays. Um, let's go to the end. You'll hear that spear motive that I talked about. The, uh, and you'll also hear a, the leitmotif for fire, which sounds a lot like fire. There's kind of a sparkling effervescence to it. Unfortunately, it looks like this clip ends before the section I was talking about, so we won't get to hear that today. But it's okay. We are running out of time anyway, and I, I have more stuff that I want to show. Um, I really, really enjoyed it, Darren. Thank you so much. Oh, yeah, sure. Um, I, I do have a couple more things if you're able to stick around. If not, you'll feel free to head, to head off or ask any questions. I know we're going to go for like an hour. but no, I'm fine to stay. I'm fine to stay. Okay, sure. Um, so I just wanted to <clears throat> go through like three, three more operas briefly just to um, cover some of the things after Wagner. Uh, so basically, we ha um, one that I picked was Wodzek uh, by Alban Berg. <clears throat> now, this requires talking a little bit about 12-tone, the 12-tone style of, of music. So basically, the construction of all music to this point had been focused on a melodic line and a harmonic line. So a melody being like, you know, whatever is played on top and a harmony being like chords underneath. Um, Twelve tone music basically kind of reduces the structure of, of music to a grid and to um, mathematical equations. So if you look at the piano, I think you can see well, there are 12 keys on the piano. I'll play them in case you can't see them. And then it repeats again with the same 12. So basically with 12 tone music, you take what's called a tone row and you make a melody out of that. So you, but you can only use, use those notes a single time. So it ends up being something that sounds very foreign like. It, it doesn't sound very melodic to our ear. So he started this in 1914, was interrupted by the war, and it's essentially a reaction to the war. So it has a kind of a very disturbed element to it. So let's just look at a little bit of this, just so you can hear a little bit of the 12 tone. I'm not going to bother sharing the screen. Sweet honey, 
All right, let's stop there. So you can kind of get the feeling that it's not really like anything that we've heard up to this point. It's very far in, in style. Um, let's talk a little bit about Peter Grimes. I do want to show you this because it's one of my favorites. I'd love to, to, this is a show that I'd love to do here someday. It's very complicated though. Um, let's play this. So it's based on a book by George Crabb called Thabara written in 1810. It's a, it, it takes place in a small English uh, fishing town, which is also kind of why I wanted to, why I'd like to have it here someday, because the, the whole attitude and the whole feeling of this show is very much like what it is in Goolsboro. <coughs> um, he was drawn to the story because of the exiled character. Um, the, the, the composer, Benjamin Britten, was gay, and he was drawn to this story because it's essentially about a character who, who is exiled from his close-knit uh, community. And the action, as I said, the action takes place in a small fishing town in England. Now let's stop this share and share the other thing. So the, this section that I chose, I believe, is the, the storm scene. This is not the stuff. This is actually not the storm scene. This is a shanty scene, which is also kind of cool. All right, so that, that's at the end of the act where they're all celebrating at the pub with the shanty. Um, I also chose this one because I, I can send this these slides around because this is actually a, a full performance of it, which is quite cool. So you can watch the whole thing if you have time. But like I said before, I think everyone's got more time than they normally do. Um, okay, Akhenaten. Two more things I wanted to show everyone. Akhenaten. Um, Akhenaten and uh, Nixon in China. So these are two minimalist operas, the, meaning that this, the style was essentially created, that the plot and the music was advanced through large-scale changes in structure. So basically with Akhenaten, the whole first section is... just that A minor chord over and over again for about 20 minutes. Sometimes it's varied. Sometimes it goes quicker, and then it goes back slower. So it, it, the idea was that then, when you do have something that changes, it adds a lot more um, contrast. So let's look at a little clip of Akhenaten. This is actually from a production at Indiana University that I was in. China's blaming the U.S. for this whole virus thing. What? Yeah, sorry. Wait, on TV. where are we? That's crazy, because you know. Uh huh. Um, screen share. Got too many tabs open here.
let's pause right there so I can show you a little bit of Nixon in China. But basically, on surface level, that is not very complicated, like because the harmony stays relatively the same. But below the surface level, it's actually incredibly complicated because there's so many rhythmic things going on at once that it gets quite complicated. Um, let's just look a little bit at another minimalist opera, uh, Nixon in China by John Adams. And then I will have one last thing I want to show everyone, and then we're all done. Stop this share. This is a different composer, but it's also the same minimalist style. So small changes in harmony, um, and yes. And you can assume that you know, I assume that you know that the story is based on the title. <laughs> So you, you, you could hear there that there, there was not that much going on harmonically, but there was a lot of rhythmic and complexity in the rhythm. Um, so I'll share this. Okay, so the final thing that I wanted to, to let everyone know is that the Metropolitan Opera every night is doing a different live stream. So I would encourage everyone to go online and watch some of these. The link, you just go to www.metropolitanopera.org and it has, it has a blurb about their nightly live streams. And it's all from archive shows that they, they have done in the past. And they've, they've actually even taken out some of their old archive shows, which was quite interesting to see. Um, okay, did, let me stop the screen share. Does every, anyone have any questions about anything? No? Okay. Well, thank you all for, for joining. I hope you learned something, and I, I hope you enjoyed it. Thank uh, you very much. Sure. Thank you very much. Yeah, so. Are we, are we doing this again next week, Deren, or? I mean, <laughs> I would be happy to uh, talk about opera more, but I think, I mean, this is a yeah. Great, a great, over, you know, overview. Yeah. 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 I mean, if it... If there's interest in having it again, I'd be happy to. But as of now, I thought that, that, that it was kind of a yeah. one-time overview. But if there's interest, I would be, because it's kind of it's kind of painful to me to to go that quickly through all of yeah. this opera history. I would have probably spent the whole hour talking about Orfeo, the the the, the one that I right. started. With. No, I I'd listen well, to that. Really, <laughs> really. All right. Interested. Well, yeah, sure. I, I would be happy to do like a just kind of stretch it out go through a little bit slower so yeah i i, I, I danced in um i danced in gluck's orpheus and your dj oh okay yeah many Another, years ago <laughs> well, well, actually if, if i had spent more time talking about that's that specific opera i'd like to to to, to kind of compare them because there's an interesting there's a the scene where orpheus is trying to to um trying to essentially sing his way 
into the underworld and charming mm-hmm. everyone. It's a great scene in both of the, of the shows, but it's really cool to see how they handle it uh, differently. Be because the one that's classical period, the uh, the uh, Gluck one, handles it. It's basically a lyrical aria, which is kind of what I was talking about how about in in a, a broken classical. The arias were more more important than the uh, recitative, but actually in in the Orfeo in Orfeo by Monteverdi, the earlier one, it's done as a uh, recitative, and it's quite cool because there's all this sort of swirling, elismatic style that is kind of trying to illustrate through the music how he's trying to charm, which is very interesting. Uh, but, thank you so much, Darren. Yeah, sure. Yes, uh, thank, you. thank you. Thank you. Yeah, sure. Glad okay. you can all come out. I hope Bye. I'll see you next week. Okay. Yeah, okay. I'll, yeah, I'll, I'll be in touch if, if about what's going to happen for the future. But okay. Thanks a lot. Okay. Bye. Thanks, Jerry. Sure. Good to see you. Bye.